Hello and welcome to another edition of What Does the Giraffe Say Media with me, Kathleen Rotone. We're an organisation that aims to connect people in conservation by holding live interviews on social media. Today I am very happy because I am joined by Sasha Dench, otherwise known as the Human Swan, and also the CEO of Conservation Without Borders. Um, so Sasha, I'm going to hand over to you if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, what was your driving force behind you getting involved in conservation? Um, and it's now becoming a, a big focus of your life. Is it something that was a big event? Was there a person that was responsible, part of your upbringing? Can you talk to us a little bit about this? Oof, okay, I can't really remember a time when I wasn't interested in nature. So I think that's a, that comes from being born in Australia. I grew up part of the time on the northern beaches of Sydney, where I had all the liberty of exploring the coast. That was at a time where in northern Sydney, everybody had tiny little houses, not the big posh uh, million dollar homes they have these days. And nobody ever locked their door. And uh, yeah, the, the ocean and the sea was our playground. And my mother at the time actually lived uh, in the bush uh, down in southeast Australia. And uh, they're in a house that they kind of, well, we built ourselves over time. And so there I had, again, the full liberty to go and explore there. And my nearest friend was two hours walk away. Um, and we didn't, ha we didn't have telephones in the bush then, uh, not in the beginning anyway. So, um, yeah, we were basically allowed to go off and camp for a couple of days uh, at a time on our own. And uh, as long as some, we were near somebody's house and we were always pretty much following a river. So I had a pretty wild and nature-filled uh, upbringing. Both my parents also were really... Uh, were divers and into and into the sea as well so I guess I uh, yeah grew up surrounding by nature and kind of feeling very much uh, at home in nature my my mum's place uh, was yeah as I said a house that was built over time when we first moved there it was a 40 acre block of bushland that bordered on a river it was a one room wooden a uh, house on stilts uh, with a can toilet out the back and uh, we didn't have fridge or power or anything so the the, the, the fridge for, for putting meat and cheese in was a metal box, kind of what we used to call it, with lots of little holes in it. And uh, it would hang, hang up and had a wet uh, cloth over the top of it. And the sort of breeze was meant to keep it, uh, keep it cool. Uh, yeah, so it was, a, it was a pretty wild upbringing. And um, we also didn't have a way of locking the door. So there was, the house had been built from uh, bits of reclaimed pubs and other things. So really interesting. But yeah, didn't have locks on, on doors at all. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that's where it all started. Both my parents are into nature. My mum moved to the bush uh, with a Dutchman to try and she basically she'd grown up in Switzerland and uh, but she wanted to be self-sufficient. She wanted to try that. Uh, and yeah, as I said, my dad was always out in the in the sea. Um, so that's, I suppose, where my love of nature started. When did it turn into conservation? I guess. Where I lived with my mum, we were, whilst we lived in a pretty wild block, it was uh, forestry land. Well, forestry land was all around it, so the forestry roads to our house. Um, and the, the town we were near was a town called Eden, which was the, the whaling capital of Australia um, until about 1975 when it was banned. And since then, it had been a, a hub for, for fisheries. So we'd been seriously fishing and overfishing for a very long time. Uh, most of the fish from the area actually went either up to Sydney or went into a cannery. So there was a kind of a, um, and there was also the, the logging industry there. So the logging industry was owned by a Japanese company that employed most of the local people. So what you ended up with, ended up being, I suppose, in the centre of, uh, well, at school, for example, there were friends of mine whose parents were definitely in the, uh, in the greeny uh, brigade who would be out uh, training themselves to trees and trying to stop the logging of old growth forest and others whose parents were either in uh, in fishing or working in the logging industry. So you very much got to see us those, both sides of those sort of conflicts. And I have a feeling that's probably where my, my interest started from. Uh, and then I suppose there were yeah, various incidences in which I guess to be interested in conservation, I think you really, more than just sort of nature, you have to not only kind of be aware of those issues, but also feel like you have some kind of power um, and power to change things. And I think, yeah, again, growing up in nature and feeling like I kind of understood how it, how it worked, I wasn't kind of scared of it, is one positive. Uh, but also I think it is a power to 
have the, have the level of empathy or develop the kind of empathy you do in an environment like that. So, for example, like I said, I kind of understand the point of view uh, of the of those in fishing or in logging, but also understand the, the point of view of others. So I think, yeah, growing up with that level of empathy um, is gave me a, a feeling of kind of power. Like I felt I knew how to influence people and potentially how to to influence change. Uh, is that enough of an intro to you? Yeah, that's, no, that's absolutely perfect. I mean, it's um, <clears throat> it just goes to show that kind of being around nature is something that can make you powerful uh, impact and make you want to protect and conserve what you love. And I think that's kind of what stems through from there. Um, now, you've had several different careers where you've managed to get conservation kind of in there. Mm -hmm. But today we're going to be focusing a little bit more on your Conservation Without Borders story. Um, now, could you tell us a little bit about the background of that, how that came about, um, but also you, know, you focus a lot on the power of imagery, video and storytelling. Yeah. Why do you think this is a positive tool for conservation communications? Oh, I, I kind of feel like it's everything. Having been a scientist, so I was, uh, well, I studied biology and genetics. Uh, I used to work on turtles and sharks and genetics. Uh, but I just repeatedly saw the, well, the yeah, the, the power of the story, the power of the different ways that you approach people, even with the same problem. And uh, yeah, found. I mean, I had a had a really specific hard learning. I'll be able to share that first of uh, of how data and research isn't everything. And um, I suppose my my strongest learning there was. The fact again, at one part in my life, I was back in Australia and I started, I was out in the sea all the time. I was a yeah, competitive free dive at one point. So the sea is my is my comfort zone. Um, so I started swimming out to the shark nets that I knew were out there and uh, got interested in those and saw actually that the shark nets were nothing at all in Australia. They're nothing at all like what people thought they were. They were mostly not catching uh, dangerous sharks. In fact, I never found a dangerous uh, shark of a dangerous species and size in a caught in a shark net, plenty of other things. Um, so I decided to try and do something about it. So through freedom of information, I got uh, data from all the, the fishermen that, um, that clear out the nets uh, from all along the New South Wales and Queensland coast and uh, analysed that all. And it was they were pretty powerful statistics. And uh, I thought people would be horrified, but they were like disinterested. And then next thing you know, I started swimming. As I was out there free diving. I was taking, started taking a camera with me to film stuff that was caught in the nets and uh, dead and alive and then suddenly people you know were quite a lot more more interested um, but then I became Australian freediving champion and suddenly the Australian media like were really interested in what I had to say about sharks they didn't necessarily ever ask whether I even had a whether I had any scientific training at all or data um, and at the time to be completely honest I was horrified by this like why why are you caring about the voice of a sports person on this issue this is kind of you know outrageous and it cheapens the data and all the rest of it and then I had to kind of had a, take a long, hard look at myself and decide actually that if uh, they obviously, they, they know the kind of stories that are getting through to the average Australian. And if that was getting a broad audience, then why not actually uh, make use of that and make use of my you know, position as a free diver, uh, where the double, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the monofin, the single fin that's, that's uh, mermaid-like, um, do all those things. If that is what it takes to get people talking about, about shark nets and shark risk and things, so um, I guess that was my my personal uh, learning. But yeah, through um, just re repeatedly, I've seen that there's you, you basically you need to have data. You need to know that, for example, a, a species is definitely in decline. You need to know uh, if kind of habitat is shrinking. All that stuff is critical. Uh, but it's really hard to turn that into action to motivate politicians and public uh, and everybody. Uh, yeah, to motivate change without having a really powerful story. And that works in so many different ways. Um, and I'd say, yeah, one of those, for example, is the difference, uh, and I'll take an example from our recent uh, well, a project with the, with the swans, uh, in which we really, wanted to, um, we really wanted to target hunters who um, we knew hunters up in the Arctic, for example, were, um, were involved in the... Uh, shooting of swans so 30 percent of all birds x-rayed had lead shot in their bodies this is living birds so we knew shooting was an issue and we had a good idea a lot of it was in uh, the Russian Arctic um, and so there are different ways that you can approach people and it, this had been tried data papers have been published on it obviously that's not read by Joe Blogs, so that's not reaching anybody 
Uh, and then you can go up and start kind of going to a hunting meeting and saying, look, we know that you're shooting swans. Don't try and pretend that you're not. Uh, we need you to stop it because the swans are dying. That's one way of doing it. It might work with a few people. Um, but another way of doing it is, uh, is going up there and uh, – presenting a, uh, why I personally kind of, the, the story of the swans, how amazing they are, why I might care about it, and, uh, and asking them to, be, um, to help us try and solve the solution. So basically offering them an option to be one of, the, one of the good guys, to be on the conservation team, rather than telling a story which instantly pitches them as the, the bad guys against the, the good conservationists, um, which I just feel so rarely works. Um, and I, yeah, from, uh, I think from really going from a point of empathy, putting yourself in the shoes of the other person and realizing most people think they're good people and want to be on the, one of the good guys. Um, you're just, you're way more effective. Um, but yes, I could go on about, about storytelling and the power of story. Cause I just have found, yeah, like I said, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's everything and it's, it's everything that's missing. And that's kind of <coughs> how you then became known <coughs> Sorry, the human swamp. That's okay. That's how you became known as the human swamp because you decided then that you wanted to do something a little bit crazy to try and raise awareness um, of the of the flight of the swan and the dangers and the issues it was facing there. Um, now that was an incredibly powerful way to get people's attention. What you did was um, hadn't been done before, um, and it was a great way of you also stopping off at the different locations from Russia all the way back to the UK and talking to people in the local communities. Was the success of this then what kind of gave you the inspiration to start Conservation Without Borders and to start doing a, little, a lot more focus on these kind of expeditions? Yes, so, and also the fact that people agreed to it. So, you know, I've over, I've over years had kind of ideas, or potentially crazy ideas, and not necessarily have been bold enough to present them all but this with this idea with the swans of you know when they were saying you know can you get lots of how do we reach the hunters and the power companies and all this and the fact that I could suggest well a what you need to start off with is, with is a really powerful story and the bird migration is one great story it's the kind of James Bond story of the bird world and then have a woman flying alongside them or trying to be a bird either way the media are probably going to jump at that story um, but the hurdle I had to get over first was to convince a load of conservationists used to tradition used to traditional methods of solving problems that conservationists have in their toolkit. Um, the fact that uh, all of them agreed uh, that actually this was so mad it might work, which is pretty much the words uh, that they used. But we had to, we were in a situation where the swans were in like really serious decline and there was, there was enough desperation that they were like, give it a go. Um, so yeah, the fact that we had enough support for, from uh, conservationists and then uh, it was a success in all the ways that I had thought that it might be. Um, so, for example, we got vast amounts of media coverage, about kind of 2,000 articles in television and radio and all sorts. And in, in Russia, where people said nobody would cover it, uh, nobody, nobody would cover conservation. I think we had 84 pieces of television coverage. Uh, so, yeah, the, the media picked up on it. There was big public support. Quite a lot of people physically responded. So, actually saw it on television and then found us on social media and send us reports in or came to try and find us or went out to try and find swans were missing. Uh, we got mass engagement then. And then, uh, whilst the scientists really didn't, they believe that this the project itself might work, they didn't believe that politicians would also be interested. And I was trying to say, I think you'll find even politicians are, like, at the core of themselves, they are people that respond to a story. And so at the end of the expedition, when we needed to go and uh, speak to politicians at the European level uh, that hadn't been responding necessarily to swans beforehand I said let me try and so I called up and say I've just flown the migration route with the swans in a paramotor can I come and talk to you about what I've seen and we got a meeting the next week with the kind of four top people that we were trying to speak to so uh, yeah the, that we could then see actually people are people and it works with the Ninets people on the tundra to have a powerful story it works uh, also with politicians so looking at all of that and then realizing once you've, once you've done an expedition like that, you then not only have you interacted with lots of people, you've made lots of friends and a network, uh, a network of people who are kind of aware and interested uh, and engaged and hopefully inspired a bit of awe. I think awe is really important to kind of, uh, I think science, there's all sorts of science behind this idea that if you inspire awe in someone, it also changes their mindset from 
kind of one of sort of survival and me and the individual um, to one of kind of big thinking, potentially creativity, but also communal thinking. So the, the right sort of thinking for people to get involved in conservation. Um, so yeah, there's all of all of that uh, was behind the project. So once you've finished it, you then end up with film, photographs, and a story that you can keep on using. And so that works for years to come. Um, uh, so yeah, I guess on the back of that, I was made uh, ambassador for the UN Convention on Migratory Species, which was a bit of a sign. And so I asked then a load of scientists at the first UN meeting I went to, uh, do you need do you need more of this? And if so, uh, is there anybody up for um, for contributing uh, as a scientist if I set up Conservation Without Borders? And uh, yeah, that was that was the start of it. And this year, where you've actually just started, you started this week your expedition and you're focusing on the flight of the osprey. Can you talk to us a little bit about the reason behind that? Why the osprey and what you're hoping to achieve on this expedition? Uh, why the osprey? Uh, okay, there's a few reasons. Uh, one of them is the, the journey with the swans was from the Russian Arctic to the UK. And that is the, the northern half of a, of a flyway that we're on. I wanted to continue the flyway because there are plenty of other issues, but different issues from the UK heading down and, and Europe heading down into Africa. Um, and uh, found myself giving a talk at the Scottish Ornithological Society and uh, met a man called Roy Dennis, who was throwing, throwing me around the, uh, the dance floor, my first ever Kalia kind of Scottish dance. And then he said, can you do the same thing for the osprey as you did for the swans? It's got a fabulous story. It's also a big, iconic bird. It's well-loved. Um, it brings people together. And I looked at it and I thought, actually, um, whilst it has a different story, it's a bird that's trying to make a comeback. It's a really positive one. So we've, uh, it, it's one that kind of already shows that in Scotland, where it was, and in, it was extinct in many parts of uh, Southern Europe and, and the UK, um, there's a, a great story there of what can happen in just a few decades if a lot of people uh, club together from government to landowners and conservationists and individuals, if they club together to try and bring a species back, just how far you can go. So it's got a great and a different story there. Um, it's also uh, has a really interesting position in the food, food chain. So being top of its food chain, uh, it relies on trees and healthy forests. It also relies on healthy uh, marine and freshwater wetlands to feed. Uh, it's feeding on fish and those fish, many of them are actually are insectivorous as well. So basically the position it sits in an, in an ecosystem, it's a really good indicator for the health of a flyway. It also, on its migration, like most birds on migration, uh, go via a series of wetlands. So anything that might be going wrong to the habitats the osprey use might also be impacting uh, other birds. So it was a perfect icon for, for a flyway and looking at, uh, yeah, the, the, the future of migratory species all along this route. Um, but there was another thing I noticed on my last expedition. So that not only uh, is kind of flying along a flyway, telling a story involving lots of people, not only is that a great way of uh, helping migratory species, which are some of the most challenging to conserve because they rely on so many countries and different people and everything else. Looking at the world through the eyes of a bird, a migratory bird, is also a really powerful way of looking at the, the, big, pi the big picture problems that we all face, the lo loss of biodiversity and climate change. Um, and through in a way that actually people is not so big that it's incomprehensible. So looking at the world through the eyes of the swans from above, um, I ended up with some really tangible examples of climate change uh, impacting, impacting birds, which is a great way to start conversations and, uh, and change. So yeah, the osprey, um, that's why I uh, chose the osprey. And yeah, what was the next part of the question? Sorry, Kat. What are you hoping that, um, that you're gonna be able to do by the end of this? Okay, so part one, I'd say, is uh, so where it's is primarily information gathering. We want to follow the journey of the osprey, uh, speak to people, look at their habitats that they're using from from the air. So we'll be using drones for this flight, and uh, yeah, speak to people all along the way about the different things that they're noticing, the challenges they are aware of for the ospreys. There is a lot of research that's being done in some of the countries along the way. Uh, but researchers are only ever there for a short amount of time and they don't see the big picture. The other thing you, that 
you can't always get when data gathering is actually the time with people to ask them not only about the threats, but also hear their ideas for the solutions and find out who in the different regions are actually the, um, the, the movers and shakers, the potential influencers, the ones we need to work with in future. So year one, it's follow the journey, create a really inspiring or share the inspiring story of, uh, of the Osprey migration, the places they go, the people they meet. We'll be doing that through social media, through creating regular videos and making a, a film at the end of it um, and make a lot of friends along the way. And then year two is when we've got the chance to take all of that information and then go back and revisit our partners and people along the flyway and industry and retailers and see if we can uh, use all that information to drive change. Um, and again, what we'll have is not only data, but also powerful stories from uh, of, of people and the places that we've been to. So yeah, I'd like to see actually that within two years, at the end of two years, um, we can actually make quite significant change. And the reason that I think that is, um, yeah, looking at even the examples I'm aware of just from distant research, there are places where a particular industry, extraction of a certain resource is having a big impact. And in fact, that whole impact is coming uh, from or nearly all of it is is coming from from the UK and from the major UK retailers. So if all of the retailers get to, got together and decided that actually they weren't going to buy that anymore or they weren't going to buy it if it was made in that way, then we could solve the problem really quickly. All we have to do is be able to present them with evidence of the issue, a powerful story that they will help will help explain also to uh, to customers why they might have changed that particular product. Um, and then also a solution um, and, and then be able to show the impact. Because I, I just don't think these things are very complicated in the, I mean, they're complex, but they're easy enough to solve. But you have to force people to sit together, look at the big picture and, uh, and want to, to make a difference. And I, I think the mentality is, is getting there. I completely agree. I think it's now becoming a point where people, organisations have to be seen to be doing something because then the, the actual negative press that can come from it um, can actually be more damaged than, than not changing their ways. Um, now, the expedition, there's nine of you, um, all different nationalities. You're going across more than 10,000 kilometres through over 14 countries ending in Ghana. Um, I know you've literally just started, but what do you think is going to be the thing that's going to excite you the most? And on the flip side, what do you think is going to be some of the biggest challenges? Oof. What's going to excite me the most? Uh, meeting unusual, different people, having my prejudices or beliefs smashed, which will regularly happen. Uh, and uh, that's what it's all about, to kind of really feel like I get an idea of who's who and what's what. I, I love meeting strangers. I know for a lot of people that's, uh, that's not their idea of a great time, but I, I enjoy, yeah, unusual situations. And uh, I, I think also our team are a pretty excellent mix. I mean, a very diverse mix, but uh, yeah, we've been together for just over a week now and that's all, that's all working pretty well. So I really look forward to seeing just what we're going to create. Um, the most challenging thing, mm, I'd say it's going to be borders and uh, uh, borders and potentially weather. I'd say they're probably going to be the most challenging. We will look a bit unusual at borders, and I'm just not sure how we will be welcomed. Um, we have certainly taken the, the Land Rovers we're taking, the, the, the ones that looked uh, manly and macho, that one in particular was, um, was a military ambulance. So we've gotten rid of the, um, the army green and painted it white with ospreys all over it. Um, some people have said we look like a target. Others have said we'll just look unthreatening, but we will see. Uh, but yes, I, I think we've got a pretty solid team who will be able to cope quite well. And we have put them through some very rigorous training that they weren't necessarily expecting um, with, uh, yeah. Uh, and they all, they all managed to keep their, keep their cool under stress, whether it was, um, yeah, physical or having uh, people with uh, heavy weaponry turning up and trying to manhandle them, get them out of vehicles, etc. Uh, yeah, I've been pretty impressed. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I think it's going to be an absolutely incredible experience. And if people want to follow along, you can do by checking out the Conservation Without Borders social medias. They're across all the different platforms from Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, 
uh, LinkedIn, and we've li literally just launched a TikTok site as well. So there's everything for everyone, and there's going to be different content on all the different platforms so you can follow along, and as well as the educational side, they're going to be showing the life on the road, the realities, the highs and the lows, and all the different kinds of challenges they're going to be facing on their expedition. Um, we've got a question coming through from Rosie. Hi, Rosie. And she is asking, um, when talking ospreys, which nest birds should we be watching? Oh, I just say your local birds. In fact, I've known whereabouts is Rosie from. I'd say, uh, yeah, watch your local birds, like your local wildlife. They're the ones that's the kind of region that's within your uh, power to support and look after. So, yeah, I'd say I'd say local. But to be honest, uh, dipping in and out of all of them, we put all of the all the ones in the UK, we've put them on our map so you can dip in and out. Um, but I think if you want any of the forums, any highlights get shared with people. So, uh, yeah, but focus on local, I'd always say. And then we have another question coming through from Cindy. Um, and they're asking, how did you start your conservation journey? They're interested in this field and looking for some advice. Um, I think I know from doing these shows before, there's a common misconception that you have to have a science background to get into conservation and you can't be a conservationist without having that kind of thing. Um, what's your thoughts on this? What would you suggest for those who want to start out in this field? I'd be potentially controversial and say I think there's enough biologists and ecologists in conservation. They are they have a one narrow kind of skill set uh, in the grand scheme of things. But we I would say we probably need everybody to consider that actually whatever role they have, that considering the state that the planet's in at the moment, we all need to be bringing conservation into our ordinary roles, whatever they are. But there's definitely space for all different sorts of, uh, of careers. So, for example, in order for us to put this together, I have relied on and, and to drive change in the past. I've relied on lawyers. I've relied on designers. I've relied on uh, speech writers. Uh, yeah, all, all sorts. I um, definitely think there's enough conservationists. And I think most conservation charities, if, uh, if you have a, a different kind of skill, um, I would say, yeah, offer it to... Uh, Offer it to locals and see what uh, to local organisations and see if they actually need uh, whatever you can do. Uh, there's also I know there's volunteering kind of websites uh, where charities can put up notes of uh, volunteers they need. And if you just getting a bit of experience, um, if if you're the kind of person that knows how to, I suppose create a role for yourself. I've quite often done that. Um, yeah, uh, offer your skill to somebody. And then try and either see if you can demonstrate the, the value uh, to them. And then you can use it either to get work with them or, uh, or to find work elsewhere. But, yeah, I worked for, for a, a while, very well paid in a, in a standards organization. And whilst I wasn't, uh, my brain wasn't engaged to say that in the, what the standards organization was doing. It's very important work, but it wasn't for me. I did manage to convince them to um, to adopt standards which were all around uh, the environment and environmental standards. So that kind of yeah, that that at least uh, kept that into my into my work. But I definitely think yeah, we should all be trying to um, be conservationists. Yeah, <clears throat> it's, it's something that everyone can bring their own unique skills to the table for sure. Um, and we've got a question coming over from Alison. Uh, hi, Alison, and she's asking which countries will you be visiting? Uh, okay, so UK, uh, that's Scotland, England and Wales, uh, then France, Spain, Portugal, Morocco, Mauritania, this is just a geography test now, isn't it? Mauritania, uh, Senegal, Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. If that's 14, I've got them all. Yeah, that was. So yeah, that's all the countries they'll be going to. Um, and then we've got another question coming through asking uh, what is the duration for migration birds leaving the UK um, and going into Africa and then coming back again? Uh, okay, so there's, it It varies. Uh, so the, the bird, yeah, different birds use different types of flight. The osprey uses soaring flight mostly, so it will look for where there's thermals and uh, gain altitude then and do long glides. Um, other birds will flap the entire way to Africa. So the amount of time that it will take them depends very much on, on the bird uh, and the conditions at each site. If the weather's horrendous, they might have to stop off at a site for a long period of time. The ospreys, I think, have been known to do it in as quick as six weeks, in fact, even shorter. 
Um, but yeah, the return journey, most juveniles, juvenile ospreys, uh, don't come back uh, to the UK and Europe in their first year. They spend, they, they spend two years down uh, in Africa uh, getting strong before they return to the UK and try and, and look at sort of an, an creating a nest site or a thinking about breeding even. And don't and the other question was about sorry, there was another oh, bit yes. about weather. There was another question about weather. Uh, yeah. yes, okay. So in terms of in terms of weather, birds will generally look for tailwinds where they can, and the ospreys will look for tailwinds and uh tailwinds and um and yeah, warm weather where they've got updrafts. On their journey back north, I think it's much more strenuous. They often have to kind of fight fight weather to get north, but certainly on their journey south, they um they will take the easy route if they can. As we all do. Um, so as well as doing your, um, your conservation work, the, the, because of the different things that you've done, whether that be in your extreme sports band or your expeditions itself, it's also given you a bit of a platform to become something of um, a motivational speaker. And you've done a lot of different talks at, um, on different platforms. There was a TED talk that I watched that I thought was really interesting, where you mentioned that your um, that you had a fear of turbulence having been on a on a plane journey once which was pretty horrific and it gave you that that terror and yet when you started with your flight of the swans you had to do um a simulator of what would you oh, yeah. do in uh, a, a case of turbulence um if you get a chance to look at the ted talk have a look at the ted talk there's a video of it which made my stomach go just watching it um so that you you had that fear anyway but you still went and did it. At the minute, you, you, um, you, you've had an accident where your legs, um, and one of them is still in a metal casing, um, but you're still pushing yourself both mentally and physically to go on, these, on this expedition. What drives you to do this? What gives you that motivation? And if someone's a little bit nervous or they have genuine fears about doing certain things, but they need to do it, um, what would you advise them to do to get, get through that? Mm, I guess... For for me, the key thing is that I have found an area of conservation where I think uh, the kind of the sweet spot, which is really where my passions um, align with the things that I think are important uh, and my skill set. So where I think I can really make a difference. I've been lucky enough that those, even though at the moment I'm not able to fly and my I'm, I'm uh, walking with crutches, I, my skill set is broad enough that I still think I can, I'm still working in this area, able to go on an expedition and have a lot of impact. Um, so that's, I suppose, a key thing. Find something where you are, th those things all align because that's where you'll have the most strength to carry on and overcome hurdles. Um, so, yeah, if your if you're passions and the things that you, um, I guess, you're, what, what fires you up, but also what you logically think is important. Um, and where your skill sets are is important is great. And then the other thing is, I think my my belief in and my interest in the kind of subject is way bigger than me as an individual and my legs at the moment. So I wake up in the morning and I think about I think about conservation. I think about the big issues. What we haven't mentioned in this chat yet is um, that on the Swan flight, obviously climate change was repeatedly. I just saw it repeatedly hard kind of examples of how it's impacting wildlife and uh, and people um, but also we lost our family home in the Australian bush five so the home that I mentioned uh, and uh, to a fire that was like on a scale that hadn't been seen before and it's made climate change feel quite personal um, and it is yeah it's way bigger than it's way bigger than me and uh, what might be happening with my legs today so uh, yeah found something that that is um that's that's bigger um, and if you have that, I think that you can overcome most things. If your kind of focus is on the on what's ahead, it's a bit like in driving. You need to look um, a long way ahead rather than at the road kind of right in front of you. Uh, that's, I think, part of it. I also, again, I think growing up in the, in the bush and having a very childhood where I was given the freedom to experiment meant that I kind of trust that I can I can solve problems and I you have the freedom to kind of fail and maybe fail in private and I'm not really scared of failure anymore I mean as long as what I was trying to do was uh was for good and had the interest of a lot of people or others in mind then um what's the shame really in failing I think that's something that that um I'd like for a lot of people a lot more people to feel that actually 
uh, it's not you've just learnt uh, one way that maybe doesn't work um, and have in more information uh, that might make you more successful next time. So, yeah, try and just not be not be afraid of failure because people won't notice it for very long anyway. Yeah, that's true. And if you're doing things for the right reasons, then people will respect it whether you um, you succeed or not. I think um, yeah. we have a question coming through coming from Jason. Hi, Jason. Um, he's asking, do you consider yourself a compassionate conservationist by all of its meaning? Um, I'm guessing what he means by that, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, Jason, is you take other people's situations into um, consideration. For example, when you were talking with hunters in uh, Russia, you were listening to why they're doing it rather than lecturing this yeah. is wrong. Yeah, you have no power if you go in there just talking about something you know nothing about. So, I mean, I'll give you a very tangible example with the, the hunters. We can sit uh, in a room full of, uh, of researchers and talk about hunters and everybody's got a picture in their head of what a hunter is. I went up to the Arctic and uh, inquired and went to speak to as many people as possible in hunting. And we found that hunting up there includes the Nanettes who haven't got um, any agriculture. So they rely on meat and berries and mushrooms uh, pretty much. So they need to hunt, but they are completely comfortable with having animals like reindeer that are pets. They also use them for transport um, and they re revere them, but they will also eat them. So they are comfortable with that kind of relationship with animals. Um, but the hunters are also Southern Europeans who uh, fly up in helicopters and want to pay somebody a lot of money to go out and shoot 100 white birds. Um, but it's also, uh, I found when landing at a, in a tiny community where I was asked to go and speak to all the school children in one, they were all crammed in one room from five to 18. And I asked them, uh, yeah, just the teacher, do they all know much about nature? And they said, oh, yes, most of them start shooting at nine years old where before they come to school in the morning, they're hunting for their family. So now I know that when we talk about hunters, uh, of uh, potential hunters of oh, sh people shooting swans, we're talking about everything from reindeer breeders to southern Europeans to uh, nine-year-old, potentially nine-year-old children. Um, and, uh, yeah, you haven't really got any chance of solving something like that unless you have enough compassion to go up, get to know them, get to know why they're doing it, and um, that's, how you, that's how you try and find a solution. And you're much more likely to drive that change if they like you. Yeah. Yeah. And also if you give them a viable alternative as well instead of just saying, okay, don't do this, it's bad, it's, it's coming up with solutions together. To, yeah, um, quite, to... quite often, quite often they, they have the solutions, which is a nice thing. So they'll say, actually, well, we don't have to do that. But can you tell us which species in most declines? So someone will be honest and say, actually, at certain times of year, like if we need to eat something or we've got to shoot something or can you change the hunting season? Because during our hunting season, actually, this is what species is mostly coming through. So um, I've just found that, like, that yeah, if you, are, if you offer them the chance to not only hear, um, they also, I think you also have to give them the liberty to ask the questions because there were some things certainly that the, the, the people of the Arctic were a bit incredulous about. So first of all, they were saying, how on earth can you possibly count all the swans? And, uh, and it's true because up where they are, the swans kind of gather en masse and there are lots of them and they're spread out in very remote areas. Uh, but to explain to them, actually, uh, over certain weeks all across Europe, volunteers go out everywhere and we've got very little habitat left. So they're all kind of bunched in a few places in every country. So actually we can. And being honest about all the different threats that are elsewhere, you know, the Arctic is brilliant for, for birds. Um, so, yeah, you have to give them the opportunity to question it. Some of them also said things like, well, we know that the swans are protected, but um, we thought that was just because they're in fairy tales and nobody likes shooting swans because they're, uh, you know, you, you read them in, in fairy tale books. Um, so, yeah, I had to explain to them the, the kind of research rationale behind it. But they are open to that conversation. So, yeah. And then we have a question coming through from Jeff. I'm just going to bring that one in. Thank you, Jeff. Great question. He's asking... If you are able to affect one change as a result of this project, what would it be? One change. Oh, hugely empowering the conservationists uh, in all the countries we go to, both by raising their profile locally, but also, uh, yeah, making, giving them, I suppose, some international backing because I think they are, uh, if they have the same sort of attitude and if we are able to keep giving them backing 
um, then they could could really help. Oh, but can I have another one? Uh, because I think the some some real power can come from them, but also I think industry needs to take a really good hard look at itself. And I think I guess if we what I'd like is for people in within industry to think about themselves as individuals and uh, as their ro their roles as humans on this planet, rather than just being a part of a machine with no power. So maybe empowering individuals to use their uh, use their rational mind rather than their corporate mind. Um, certainly for the next few decades, we've got a really limited time to, to make change happen. And then Sharon's asking, kind of feeding on from that uh, quite nicely actually, are you hoping to engage communities on the flyway on other topics such as ocean plastics and plastic pollution? as well as habitat and wetland threats? Yes, I, uh, I would see they, they are all connected. Uh, but yeah, we are specifically doing a strain of research on looking at uh, plastics along the coast and particularly uh, gathering, uh, doing transects and gathering sections of that and figuring out where it's actually come from. So yeah, plastics is a, is a big part of it. Um, thank you very much for the, for the question. Okay, well, I've only got one more question left, Sasha, and then we'll start to wrap up. Um, if anyone's got any questions that you'd like to put in, <clears throat> we're mindful of time, but please pop it in the comments. Any that we don't get to answer today um, while we're talking live, we will come back and respond for you as well. If you're watching this and it's not live and you still have a question, then please, again, do pop it in the comments section and we'll be pleased to do that for you. Um, so I, what I wanted to know from you, Sasha, is what are your hopes for the future for Conservation Without Borders? What's next? Uh, what's next? So I guess our plan from the beginning was uh, something called the 2030 Global Challenge. So trying to use up until 2030, there's plenty of, uh, of deadlines that humanity has given itself for turning things around by 2030. So, yeah, a series of expeditions around the world highlighting the impacts um, from sort of on people and also on the environment of the of the big issues but through the eyes of migratory birds um so yeah to engage a lot more a lot more people and to bring the voices of people and places and wildlife to all the big un un meetings where decisions are being made um so yeah i hope to engage a lot more people and by 2030 that we would be obsolete uh i think that's uh that's incredibly optimistic um but yeah that's what a that's what I'd love to be the case. Yeah, I think that's every true conservationist uh, dream, isn't it? That you actually don't need to, to be one anymore because there's no need yeah. for it anymore. Um, okay, well, we've had some amazing comments as we've been talking. Thank you, everyone, for all your support back home from all over the world. Um, really appreciate it. Again, if you do like it, please give us a like, comment and share. The more people who see it, the more uh, awareness we can raise for the work these guys are doing. Um, so before we say goodbye, Sasha, is there anything you'd like to finish up with? Uh, no, you should have prepared me for that question. No, but thank you for um, thank you for having me on. I think, yeah, the it's a fantastic uh, audience to get people who are already slightly interested in conservation and just need a bit more, um, a bit more, I guess, bravery. I think we need a lot more of that. So, yeah, for anyone listening, if you've got something that bugs you and a skill that you think that you can offer um, and your kind of your brain is telling you actually we've really got to do something um, for the planet doesn't matter how small it is doesn't matter how local it is uh, it's all of those actions which will really add up yeah I completely agree well thank you so much Sasha for coming on um, and again thank you everyone back home for watching but from me uh, enjoy the rest of your day thanks Kath